Ladies and gentlemen, great afternoon to you all and welcome to the book launch for One Day, One Day Konkote, written by none other than novelist and literary critic Merle Hodge. Before we get started, I'd like to invite you all to stand while we listen to a playing of the national anthem of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you. Please have your seats. Great afternoon once again and welcome to this book launch. My name is Kevin Swift. I'm one of the directors of an NGO called Tutbagai Patwa, which is an NGO dedicated to preserving everything Patwa. On this occasion, we'll be hearing about One Day, One Day Konkate, and we have a number of specially invited guests that will also be part of today's proceedings. To begin, we're gonna have an introduction of our author and of the book by Mill Hodge. Mill Hodge is a retired senior lecturer of the University of the West Indies. She has also taught at two American universities and in the teacher education program of the Grenada Revolution. She is a cultural and social activist, co-founder of Women Working for Social Progress, and a writer. She has published three novels, Crick Crack Monkey, For the Life of Letitia, and One Day, One Day, Gongati. Short stories, articles, and a textbook the Knots in English, a manual for Caribbean users. So this launch is being done as part of the celebration of the 80th birthday of Bill Hodge, which was one week ago. Let's give a, a round, great round of applause. And I'd like to invite you now to do the introduction. The book is set in a fictitious Caribbean territory called Kayeri. The time frame is the late 1800s to the mid 1950s. It includes a period of struggle for not only political independence, but also for cultural sovereignty, recognition and respect for the new culture developing on Caribbean soil. The central character, Gwyneth Cuffey, teacher Gwyneth, is involved in that struggle. In her younger years, she belongs to a discussion group of the kind that was springing up in some Caribbean territories in that era. Nobody could remember just how the group had got started officially, or exactly when, 1916, 1915, 
although in some meetings they seemed to spend an inordinate amount of time arguing about just that. David had grown up in a family that had hosted earnest discussion on their veranda for as far back as he could remember. He was simply carrying on the tradition handed down by his parents until somewhere along the way, the gathering got to the stage of a scheduled monthly meeting, sometimes with minutes and all. The people who gravitated to David's wide and breezy veranda were originally friends and acquaintances of his, classmates through CMI school and government college, fellow students at training school, colleagues in teaching at St. Margaret Government School. Then came others, attracted by the opportunity to stretch their intellectual muscles or to show them off. By 1918, this social and cultural society was more like an ongoing conversation, often degenerating into altercation among a bunch of mismatched bedfellows. In June 1918, Gwyneth suggested the name Moon Deme for the group. Her suggestion touched off a serious quarrel and some of the members never came back. The ones who had looked aghast or fixed their faces into a snare before they made their views known. Hog language, said one. Glorifying backwardness, said another. And Augustus L. T. Johnston, the writer of bad sonnets, delivered a speech. In their discussions, Johnston always got up from his seat to speak even a sentence, as though he was in school. Among the group, he was considered old. They didn't know his exact age, but most of the other members were in their 20s and 30s, from where any number beyond the 40s seemed like well over the hill. To Gwyneth, Johnston and his clothes looked musty. He wore a jacket that had seen better days and once white shirts with wrinkled collars. She could not remember ever seeing him take his jacket off, not once, not even on those days when the cooling breeze on David's veranda gave way to a hot, hanging stillness. Ladies and gentlemen, Johnston said, clearing his throat. Are we serious or are we not? Are we for the upliftment of this colony or are we not? If we are, then we cannot look down into the pit of ignorance to find a name that befits our standing and our noble purpose. There were groans of despair as Johnston began the drill of lifting himself onto his toes after every few words, a bad sign. It meant that he was revving up for a flight of pompous oratory, and it was going to be a task to get him to just say his piece and sit down. At some point, they were going to have to pull him down. The goodly lady has put an idea to us, Johnston lectured on. The idea is to call ourselves tomorrow's people. But in Patwa, ladies and gentlemen, let us not lower ourselves. Patwa is the language of ignorant people, Miss Coffey. People who did not go to school, and you are a big teacher. Your idea is not a bad one, Miss Coffey, if we translate it into proper French, or better still, Latin. That would be a fitting name for a group of intellectuals looking to the future not some uncivilized illiterates from a barrackyard. Johnston's speech was cut short by the indignant howls that came from most of the people present, but he and some others failed to see what could possibly be wrong with his comment. Bedlam ensued with exclamations of, take that back, or insulting, or apologize, or snob, and even, how slave and Uncle Tom. The quarrel blazed for quite some time. Now, 20 something years later, she had stirred up the same consternation and raging war of words 
by suggesting to St. Hilda's Anglican Church Mothers Union that they invite the Iron Band from St. Paul to play at the Harvest Fair. Afterwards, when Gwyneth told Mama about the contention in the meeting, she strips and asked dryly what Gwyneth was doing still up under that cabal of potoleglis, church posts, Pharisees, and you working yourself to death for them. Let them make the harvest for themselves. But not all the members were against the suggestion. From the beginning of the dispute, there were many who provided they were not in Valdapier's direct line of vision, nodded in agreement with Gwyneth and with Mrs. Knight and others who found that inviting the band was a good idea. For a while, all you could hear was Valdapier's imperious voice, shrilly assisted by her chorus, Esme Gill, Gertrude Innes, and Audrey Ferguson. For in St. Hilda's Mother's Union, when Valder Pierce spoke, no dog was expected to bark anything different. Mrs. Pierre had not quite got over Gwyneth's being in Mother's Union, and worse, expressing opinions not shared by Mrs. Pierre. So, as often happened, she responded to Gwyneth by speaking as though Gwyneth wasn't there. Of course, Miss Coffey wouldn't see anything wrong with bringing some young blackguards in among decent people. Not me and those vagabonds. They're always in trouble with the police. You mean the police are always troubling them, Gwyneth remarked. Making music is not breaking the law. They're outside the law because the law casts them out, just like the shouters. Sometimes when you hear barge on behavior, it's just young men standing up for the right to make their music. Gwyneth was startled by a little burst of applause, muted and short-lived, because Valdapier beamed a scowl around the group. Hmm, said Mrs. Pierre. Music? You call that music? No tune, just knocking old iron, making noise? Taking dustbin to say they're making music? What good music could come out of a nasty dustbin? You ever hear iron band, Mrs. Pierre? Gwyneth asked in a sugary voice. Me, why I would want to hear that? Oh ho, so you're just talking from hearsay? Let me tell you, an iron band is a rhythm band, beating sweet, sweet rhythms for people to sing and dance to. Like Tambu Bambu. Gwyneth cocked her head to one side mischievously. You know Tambu Bambu, Mrs. Pear? Mrs. Pear opened her mouth to say something, but Gwyneth raised her voice slightly to discourage her from interrupting looked her straight in the eye, and continued. Valdepea's backup singers were no use to her at this point, unwilling to engage when it came to a one-on-one -on -one verbal contest with Gwyneth Coffey. Don't worry, they say some of the young men looking to make notes on the iron now, Mrs. Pear. One day they'll be able to play any tune you want on that same old iron you're talking about. But even after that, we will still have bands that make pure rhythm. We always had rhythm bands with all kind of drum, skin drum, tambu bamboo, pitch oil pan, and we will always have rhythm bands long after you and me dead and gone, Mrs. Pierre. That's the African in us. Gwyneth smiled smugly with this last remark, relishing the sting it would give Valder Pierre. Mrs. Pierre screwed up her face and mumbled something about Gaviite foolishness not quite under her breath. And who is us, she asked out loud. Who here born in Africa? Instead of we thank God for bringing our forefathers out of there so we could better ourselves, you all want us to be African? All who encouraging these young men in their worthlessness, they will regret it. No ambition. Negro people have no ambition. You see any high color boys in that? No, it's only black hen chicken. Wait till you see those warahoons in St. Paul start breaking bottles to stab one another, like the ones in town. Valdapier continued to hold court until some of the women began to object, politely at first. Mistress Pierre early invented. That not nice, Mistress Pierre. How you could be washing your mouth on poor people children so? calling them all kind of rab and ruffian and hooligan and dregs. Janice, 
stand up for your God child. Janice was only too happy to offer Mistress Peer a piece of her mind on behalf of her godson, Mervyn, who was a member of St. Paul Syncopator's Iron Band. Yes, she scowled at Valder Peer. My godson, Eno Vagabond, you hear? He's a decent young boy who does respect everybody. So you will please to respect him and mind how you talk about people children like there is rubbish in the road. What had started as a low brooding murmur was giving way to sharply raised voices. My sister in town have two sons playing in an iron band, Gemma Bob informed Mrs. Peer, wagging a finger in the air. And nobody I have no right to talk about my nephews like that. There was loud agreement. Then Earlene and Octavia and some others stood up and stayed on their feet, the better to let Mistress Peer know just where to get off. By this time, Valda Peer's voice could no longer be heard above the din, and, sh and she had to give up trying to be chairman of the meeting. She put her handbag on her lap and, and sat clutching it. Earlene's voice rose above the rest. OK, Mother's Union, so we want to bring the Iron Band in Harvest Fair? There was cheering. Earlene conducted a vote, assisted by Mrs. Knight, and Mother's Union voted in favor of inviting St. Paul Syncopators to perform in the Harvest Fair concert. Mother's Union sent a message to St. Paul Syncopators via Janice's godson. But what came back to them was disappointing news. The St. Paul police had so harassed and hounded the boys over the past few weeks that their band was no more. The last straw was when a party of officers, batons in the air, cornered them behind the pavilion in the savannah and rained blows on anybody who didn't manage to slip through their hands and run. So we're moving along, and at this time we are going to hear some vintage songs of that language. It's right. Yeah, the screen is very hopefully you can see it. Yes, hopefully you can see the screen despite the sunlight. Vintage songs in that uncivilized language from the barracks. We're gonna have first up, Mama, call the brigade. It's a tragedy. Shagornas is burning. And this was originally performed by Calypsonian Wilmuth Houdini in the 1930s, in an era where all Calypso would have been written and sung in Patois. This rendition we're going to listen to was redone by David Burrow and friends. So we hope that you can see. Mama, call the fire brigade.
Deux, trois. Mango vert, mango ti, mango vert, mango ti. Moi blanc, je l'aime pour acheter. Mango vert, mango ti. Pas moi, je l'aime pour acheter. Mango vert, mango ti. Mango tout doux sous ses matins. Et sous ça, tout pour moi. Mango tout doux sous ses matins. Et sous ça, tout pour moi. Péché à qu'à passer et puis toute qualité poisson. Poisson rouge, belle tasse. Poisson petit, poisson c'est capa bouillon. Poisson, poisson c'est un bel déjeuner. Poisson, poisson c'est un bel déjeuner. Les poissons jaunis. Poisson chaudia, poisson, poisson, c'est un bel déjeuner. Young man, your trousers have a hole. I'm a Thailand. Young man, your trousers have a hole. I'm a Thailand. Depuis ma ma fe moi non poco pa moi bois. I'm a Thailand. Depuis ma ma fe moi non poco pa moi bois. I'm a Thailand. Young man. Trousers falling down. I'm a Thailand. Young man, your trousers falling down. I'm a Thailand. JP mama fe mwen no poko pa mwen bwa. I'm a Thailand. JP mama fe mwen no poko pa mwen bwa. I'm a Wonderful. I omitted to mention in citing David Barrow's name that among his friends featured yours truly. So you will have just heard from say on Bagai Patwa Choir. Uh, we are a small group that do these traditional songs from our history, from our past. Um, and there are many members. Of course, we have a member who is featured in the back and also a director to Bagai Patwa, Miss Michelle Mora Fodringham. Uh, you would have seen as well Aisha Wharton, who is hiding in the back, and of course many other faces, Jake Saloum, uh, Zoom Saloum, who is Soka Elvis, but when he joins the Patwa band, we call him Patwa Elvis. To continue with this afternoon's program, we're going to have a perspective on One Day, One Day Congo Day done by Dr. Marjorie Thorpe. Marjorie Thorpe is a former Dean of Humanities at the University of the West Indies. Between 1989 and 1992, she headed the mission of TNT to United Nations in New York and was subsequently appointed to the United Nations Development Program, or UNDP. On returning to Trinidad in 2000, she continued in public service till her retirement as the chair of the Public Service Commission. And she continued in that role until 2016. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Dr. Thorpe to the lecture. A couple of weeks ago, I was having lunch with a school friend who was on a home visit from the United States where she works and lives. The waitress was a woman in her early 30s, very cheerful, but she nearly had a fit when my friend, ignoring all the exotic sounding drinks listed on the menu, asked for a glass of Moby. 
This is a prestige restaurant, she says. Hands raised, eyes open wide. Me, my friend immediately asked to see the manager. Meanwhile, I am sitting there, totally embarrassed and mortified, just saying, thank God, Gwenny Coffee not here. <laughs> but, of course, she was there. She was here, there, in much the same way as Bezoas or Antoinette become, step out of the pages of a novel and become lodged in our heads. And so there is Granite Coffee in my head, nudging me and reminding me of Camus' observation that fiction is the lie through which we tell the truth. Kayarians, it's not me, it's Camus. <laughs> Kayarian society is the product of multiple ancestries. The book is about Kayarian society. It's, about, it's the product of multiple ancestries. And the plot covers the period between, I think it's 1912 and 1956 when the descendants of formerly enslaved Africans and indentured East Indians are still living under the authority of a colonial power. Hodge deftly uses the tools, the satirists' tools of humor and irony to make us laugh, even as she reveals the ongoing impact of the social structure on her character's lives. The ways in which the beliefs and patterns of behavior entertained, indeed even nurtured by elements in Kayarian society, not only demean us as individuals or as members of a particular community, but I think even more dangerously how they strike out and deny our sense of our shared and inseparable humanity. In the opening scene of the novel, Hodge introduces us to the way in, by way of a very brief exchange to all the areas of Kairian society that are later developed in the course of the narrative. And I want to say that Merle's, her command of the craft of the novel is outstanding. And even the way in which she uses, it's a very short exchange to put out and lay before us all the different strands of Kairian society that are developed in the course of the novel. I think that is outstanding. Anyway, this is how the novel starts. The um, a father is seeking to have his son enrolled in Gwyneth Cuffey's private school. The son's uniform reveals that he is a pupil of a boys' RC school. This is the father. Madam, I want you to take this boy in your school. He ain't learning a damn thing over there. Them teachers just drawing pen and teaching the children a damn thing. I can't believe I make a dunce or stupidity. The teachers say all he wants to do is be drum on the desk. Madam, this is a worthless child and I give you license to do what you want with him. This is not laughable, but don't forget to cut his skin. This is a child, need plenty licks, so don't afraid. At this point, Gwyneth holds up her hand to silence him, directs the child to a bench under the mango tree, and returns to the father for a brief conversation. Now, I don't think the child's father is a bad man. I don't even think he is a cruel man. I think he is most likely a frightened man. A frightened man because he's conscious of his own vulnerability, because he knows that if his son does not acquire the specific skills and areas of knowledge that are deemed by those in authority to be worthy of certification, he will be condemned to remain part of his father's own oppressed 
and despised community. In fact, throughout my entire reading of the novel, I was reminded of a definition of development put forward by a CARICOM group, and I don't remember the source of, of it, so I and I'm paraphrasing it. Development is an effort by people themselves to make the most of their resources and opportunities, not only to attain a higher standard of living, but to achieve an enhanced sense of identity, self-reliance, and self-respect. Now, Hodge does not deny the reader the more painful details of life in the barracks, and a lot of the emphasis on education. Education is seen as a means through which one can get out and, and, um, and I suppose, just as, it, as the definition says, attain a better standard of living. But it, when we're discussing the issue of identity, self-reliance, self-respect, these are the qualities that are the interest of Gwyneth Cuffey's life work. This is what she wants to nurture. So whether it is a question of one's religious affiliation or the value of a locally developed musical instrument or the need to recognize and honor the multilingual character of the society, Gwyneth is unwavering in her support of the country's local traditions. And so Sonny states on his school form that his religion is Anglican and shout a Baptist. <laughs> Gwyneth is determined to have an iron band invited to the Mother's Union Harvest Festival celebrations. And on the issue of language, Gwyneth is not only adamant, she's merciless. And the passage that Merle read about her exchange with Mr. Augustus I. Johnstone, the writer of Bad Sonnets, is an excellent case in point. I, I don't, didn't hear well, but I know the, um, the debate, she, she, um, as she said, they're trying to name their new, um, their new group. He says noblesse oblige is a good name. The, um, she, and I can't pronounce it. I know I'm not going to pronounce it properly. So I'll just give a breather. Mundeme is Gwyneth's, no it's not good, Gwyneth's um, offering. And Murray read what, what, um, what, what um, Johnston says. But I don't know if she read the part, what, what brings the debate to a close. It is Gwyneth's muttered response, damn old Jumbie. And that not only ends the debate, but it also ends his relationship with the group. Gwyneth's cultural campaign is waged with the support of a host of women from the lower and middle strata of the society. These are fearless leaders who confront the challenges that pervade the substance of their lives with courage, well, well I, I should say, with it, it, in, in, in a way, I should say, that reflects Alice Walker's definition of womanism, because these women are true womanists. And Alice Walker coined the term in 1979, and it says it speaks to the courage, audacity, and selfish, assured demeanor of black women, alongside their love of other women, themselves, and what I think most importantly, all of humanity. For the womanist, then, being inclusive is a prime tenet. And talking about courage, audacity, one of the um, one of the a one of the 
instances where this is perhaps best revealed is in the way Gwyneth's mother deals with her husband about beating the children. Now, the husband is a schoolmaster. I think he might even be headmaster of this school. And the school population can't understand why everybody else can be beaten but not with the children. They think it's because they are his children. In fact, it is because Gwyneth's mother, Estelle, has laid down the law, don't beat my children, which is manner, manners in him in a big way. So, as I, I said, being inclusive is a prime tenet of womanism. And although this novel is about or celebrates, I should say, the lives of these audacious, courageous black women, it is also pe peopled by men who run the gamut from arrogant sexists to faithful partners and nurturing lovers, whose presence in the lives of the women offers proof of the sustaining power, I think, of this most intimate relationship. So I was taught, and I still believe, that the business of the creative writer is to instruct and delight. In One Day, One Day Congate, I think Merle demonstrates her mastery of the writer's craft in the way the action is developed, in the way it is structured, in the emotions that she evokes, in the, um, and in, in, in what it tells us. As a satire, I says it is amu amusing. As a story about an important period in our country's development, it makes, I think, an invaluable contribution to our understanding of ourselves and of our world. Thank you. Merci and Bill, Dr. Thorpe. Merci. We're going to have a change of dynamic somewhat. We're going to have right now a reading that is going to be done by Halcyon Prescott Alexander from her work. So a bit more about Halcyon. She can be best described as a true creative, quietly contributing to the arts and entertainment industry for a number of years. She entered the carnival arena in 2007 and was successful in producing a section for the then popular mass band, Trini Revelers. She also co-directed dance company, L Infinity, for its 15 years of existence. Mm -hmm. Writing has always been a secret passion for Halcyon. For the past eight years, she has been the fashion and interior design columnist for the Trinidad and Tobago Newsday Sunday Women's Magazine. She is currently pursuing a Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing at the University of the West Indies and is working on her first novel, A Contemporary Fiction. So the following piece is a dramatic dialogue sorry, monologue, <laughs> definitely not a dialogue, written for either screen or stage. I'll see you. I'll Good afternoon. Listen to me. There is nobody who knows what my husband needs more than I. We've been married for 50 years. Isn't that something? Our love has stood the test of time. In spite of what everyone said, 50 years, a lifetime together. So now that he's weak and sick, of course I am the one to take care of him. As I said, there's nobody who knows him more than I. Nobody, not you or you, 
certainly not his pushy sisters, the know-it-alls, as I call them, coming at me, feigning concern for me, for my well-being, while all the time plotting to take him from me. Frank is mine. I am his wife. I care for him. I am the one who feeds him, bathes him, takes him to the toilet. I wipe his Not Helen. Not Judy. Certainly not that snake gray. Know it all number three. Hi, and mighty. Hi, Elaine. I'm calling for Frank. Of course you're calling for Frank. Isn't it Frank's phone I'm answering? Did you think I'd slip up for once and allow him to answer it? No. I am in control here. Get that through your thick skull. Oh. Don't look at me like that, Dr. Brooks. I tried to be nice to them. I tried for years. They never liked me. Do you know what his grandmother told me on our wedding day? She said that I must be pleased with myself finally getting into the Man Warren family. That old senile witch. One would swear the Man Warrens were second in line to Queen Elizabeth herself. Not the band of ghetto rats that they've proven themselves to be. I elevated Frank. Where was I? Right. I tried to be nice. Honest, even. I admitted I hit him, didn't I? You have to understand, I was frustrated. He was being difficult, complaining about everything when he should be grateful that he had me taking care of him, like I've done for the last 50 years. 50 years. Isn't that something? So I hit him. It was a little slap. Certainly no cause for the delegation of know-it-alls bullying their way into my home that day, pretending to be concerned for me. You can't do it all, Elaine. Get some help. Hire a nurse. Hire a nurse for what? So she could look at his privates. I am his wife. I am the best caregiver for him. What was that? Well, of course you're correct in assuming that is why they can't come to see him. They've meddled enough as it is. Also, if I wanted to share Frank, I would have had children. So no. Anyone who wants to visit has to have my permission. And to the know-it-alls, my answer is no. My mind is made up. Anyway, there's no going back now. They're blaming me for his deterioration. Yeah, he did take a tumble or two down the stairs. I can't be expected to keep my eye on him 24 hours a day, can I? You would swear I was responsible for those accidents. The way Judy, that know-it-all number two, yelled at me, talking about how many times she told me to move him to the bedroom downstairs. This is my house. It is my decision to make, and I say no. I am quite comfortable in our bedroom upstairs, thank you. What experience in caregiving has Judy? Did she single-handedly take care of her mother for five years? Did she deal with that demented, ungrateful always running away, telling everyone who would listen to call police for me? I went through that for five years. And when she finally died, and I thought I would have a rest, bam, Frank got sick. Is it any wonder that I get a little frustrated now and again? Well, you let them know for me, Dr. Brooks, that they will not succeed in this little plan of theirs to take Frank away from me. It didn't work when they sent Father Divertile to talk to me, and it's not going to work now. So you and your your sidekick here. Who are you anyway? And what business of yours is my husband's well-being? You can take your little legal letter and get out. There is no way the know-it-alls are setting foot in this house to see Frank. Pack of vipers they are. If they want to get a message to him, they can do it through me. Full stop. What do you think? I've not heard the nasty things they've been saying. Do you actually believe that I am deliberately making Frank sick? My Frank? 
50 years of marriage and I'd hurt him? Understand this. He's not going into your care for any trial period. Not for a week, not for a day, not for an hour. I don't care if you've been his doctor for 100 years. I control things here. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. What? What is happening? Who are these people? What is the meaning of this, Dr. Brooks? How dare they come in here? No, no, let go. Nobody's taking him. Do you hear me? Stop it. Frank, Frank, Frank. Thank you. Merci, merci, Halcyon. Merci, Ampil. Merci, Ampil. I think with every item, these characters come more and more to life. The reading and the perspective of Gwyneth. And now we hear Frank's owner, um, I mean, um, Frank's carer. <laughs> it's, it's quite vivid. Thank you so much. And we are going to continue with another musical interlude, our vintage songs. We are going to hear, firstly, Congo Barra. Congo Barra was originally performed by the Kiskidi Trio, Lord Beginner, Attila the Hun, and Tiger. And Congo Barra sings, Prisoner Levé, right? Mete Limie by Congo Barra, right? So prisoners get up light up Congo Barra. Congo Barra was an overseer at the time. And this rendition is being done by David Burrow and Friends. And that would be followed by another folk song, Apwe Carnavala, by the Seon Bagai Pato. Apwe Carnavala, after the carnival, we're going to look for Eligon, not before. Right? Things too nice to look for Eligon before, but after carnival, we'll look for Eligon. So, Congo Barra. Congo Barra can play with Kumwe Prisonier Levy Mete Limye by Congo Barra Mete Limye by Congo Barra Mete Limye by Congo Selewa Prisonier Levy Mete Limye by Congo Barra Jam Levy Feti Boaton Li Samdi Madi Ipliski Malewe Papa, mwe y mona dig mate, mama mwe ka flewe pou mwe. Mete li me vai Congo Barra, Congo Barra ka flewe pou mwe. Mete li me vai Congo Barra, Judge and Jewy gon try me for Muda. Hong Soti Atuna Pun Congo Bayo Guafeo Devi Ray Prisoner Levy Mete Limie by Congo Barra Mete Limie by Congo Barra Lendi Madi Jab Mante Zule Prisoner Levy Mete Limie by Congo Barra Congo Barra Congo Lawa Congo Semete Ike Mara Prisoner Levy Mete li me vai Congo Barra, mete li me doti nu kamande prisonier le. Mete li me vai Congo Barra, ati la bigena repita iga nu kashanti asun America prisonier le. Mete li me vai Congo Barra, Congo Barra, Congo Lawa, Congo Semete ike mara prisonier le. Mete li me vai Congo Barra. Congo Barra, if this kid is 
Zule Congo, Barra, it chap when there is a rape. Prison, yeah, live, live, me tell him, me by Congo, Barra. Me tell him, me by Congo, Barra, me tell him, me by Barra, oh. Apoe canavala, nu queixa se pue ligó. Apoe canavala, nu queixa se pue ligó. Camel monte, camel de sal, camel tombe na glo. Camel monte, camel de sal, camel tombe na glo. Tire, tire, tire la. Apoi canavala, nu queixa se pue ligó. Apoi canavala, nu queixa se pue ligó. Camel monte, camel de sal, camel tombe na glo. Camel monte, camel de sal, camel tombe na glo. Tire, tire, tire la. Right along, we're going to have another perspective on One Day, One Day Congote. This perspective is being done by Dr. Sheila Rampasad. Dr. Sheila Rampasad is a senior independent freelance journalist with almost four decades of output. She is also an editorial consultant and book editor. She's an academic whose work focuses on Indian African relations gender and language. Help me welcome Dr. Sheila Rampasar. Thank you so much, we had flashes on cue. Ooh. On cue, Miss Marge. <laughs> All right. So good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I suppose in the mod modern language of Netflix and other streaming devices available in these times, One Day, One Day Congote would be described as a period piece. It is with period films as it is with historical fiction. We look into the past for signposts to guide our future. And so while one day, one day Congo Tui is set in the 40s, 50s, and Miss Marja here, you say from 20, 1912 onwards, it is inhabited by tomorrow's people. People who have located themselves, who are confident in the best of themselves. And Merle, in creating these characters, is pointing us towards the best we can collectively be. And she is asking that we live our best self. This is the work of an author whose life's contemplations, her intellectual and academic contemplations, and her artistic musings have ripened, pong for pong, like the fruits in Nadia Batson's market. And this book is indeed Merle's whole blinking market. 
In it, we find full development of characters, full development of prototypes that she has created over the decades of her fiction and her non-fiction writing career. We find maturation of her artistic philosophy and her political ideology. I see this novel as a resume, as a CV of Merle's life and her ideas, and it is put in a mature and an integrated whole. Ken Follett is a Welsh author of thrillers and historical fiction, and he spoke to the BBC just this last Christmas about his interest in brave, bold characters. People who are shy, Verna, who are timid, who are cautious, says Mr. Follett, seldom get into trouble. Their lives, therefore, are predictable, and their lives offer not really much of a story to tell. But in every period of history, there are those, always few in number, who cannot, who will not, be flag bearers of their time. They are always few in number. And they instead feel trapped, oppressed by the demands of the era in which they exist. In every period of history, he goes on, they are the few who refuse to take on the identity that the society is trying to give to them. These are the people who make trouble and who get into trouble. They are the troublemakers, they are the rebels, they are the disruptors. These are the interesting people about whom films are made and books are written. 54 years ago, Merle offered us the child, Cynthia, known as T in Crick Rack Monkey. And now, more than five decades later, Gwyneth Coffey in this new novel is surely, surely Gwyneth is T grown up. And indeed, so too is Valda Peer, because it's Valda Peer, not Aunt Beatrice the bitch in Crick Crack Monkey. And Sarah and Mama are creative evolutions of Ma in Crick Crack. The ethnic solidarity at the center of this book's experience, and that is what this book is, it is an experience, is the idea that Merle tested expansively in 1993 in For the Life of Letitia. And technically too, as Miss Marge said, this is an advanced work. The world is recreated with studious accuracy. And the key that unlocks a reader's experience of one day, one day Kongote is the Creole tongue, our voice, represented in script with painstaking precision. This book is a tour de force on our Creole language or languages. It is Merle's 2011 manual, the Not in English, on steroids. <laughs> Some years ago, speaking casually to the late Professor Role, may he rest in perfect peace, I asked whether he had read For the Life of Letitia, and of course he had. What he missed in that novel, he said, was the cackle of humor on which readers feasted in Crick Crack Monkey. He was referring to the irreverent cutting humor carried in our language culture that Merle archived in that novel in 1970. Well, what I and Professor, Professor Rolle missed in For the Life of Letitia returns here to quote Patrice Roberts 10 times over. With meticulous comedic timing, Merle presents us here with page-turning mischief and piercing peacock, the kind we have been missing in our Kaiso, the kind that finds full expression in our Creole tongue and is received by the reader's creative and Creole sensibility. So in response to her girl child being lashed with a belt by a teacher, Sarah marches into the school, and the first thing she does is to lean up a coquille broom upside down 
outside the front door. The purpose, she says, is just to confuse them Catholic and them. <laughs> With technical mastery and studious respect for our language, Merle is able to create and represent our oral spoken voice in script that delightfully and deliciously cackles and crackles in our ears. I do, I actually do LOL as I read it. <laughs> the dignity and the wholesomeness of so-called ordinary people, our unique structures of families, racial solidarity, the evolutionary roles of men and women, these are the ideas that Merle has dedicated a lifetime to contemplating, to sharing, and to advocating. In this novel, she has gone the distance, creating a model of those whole and wholesome lives for which she has spent her lifetime working towards. And for these reasons, I would argue that One Day, One Day Kungutui is not a post-colonial text. It is unlike those canonical Caribbean works, generally in the Bildung's Roman formula, including Merle's own Crick Crack Monkey, that recreate for us lives damaged and disadvantaged by the colonial enterprise. This work is not post. Indeed, I would suggest that this work is a pretext. It is a book that points forward that calls our attention to a world that can be made and lives that can be made by tomorrow's people. Bob Marley and the Whalers in 1975 released a song called Jalif. The original version of this song was actually done by Lee Scratch Perry and it was not called Jalif. It was called Words Live. In One Day, One Day Congo Te, we read that revolution is fought, not only with marches and guns, but also with words. It is with words that Merle has always revolted. And it is with words that she has created for us in this novel, a revolutionary new world. I thank her for it, and I thank you for your attention. interlude at this point. We're going to hear Zinge Talala. Zinge Talala, originally done by Attila Dan in the 1930s. It's a folk story. It also has a saying in there. Zanfa Samama Malawi. Motherless children are unlucky. And that will be done by David Barrow and friends. And then we have another folk song Lundi après-midi by the Seyon Bagai Patwa Choir. Lundi après-midi, where we will hear about McLean's predicament as she falls ill. Zinge, ta la la, ma zinge, si tout mon levé la main a souyo. Zinge, ta la la, zinge, ma 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 
bai kwa po yo kwen kut pwen mi buton le ve la sui ko se twel singe talala sa pa sa mama male we za pa sa mama male we me za pa ki mi mama pied ne we singe talala sa pa sa mama male we oro koi ton be doi ka she me pi yo ka man de sa sa ye singe talala sa pa sa mama male we missi e musti ke pi mai kwe yo ka gu me e pi sa gui e singe talala sa pa sa mama male we Singe talala za pa sa mama male we Singe talala za pa sa mama male we Za pa sa mama male we yo te ka chante a ta kambule Singe talala za pa sa mama male we For those of my listeners who don't know this is an ancient number from the long ago Singe talala za pa sa mama This peculiar rhythm and melody was sung in the days of slavery. Singe talala sa pa sa mama male we. This song originated far in the dismal waste of East Africa. Singe talala sa pa sa mama male we. Kwa po pat ni pe po li ma she me kwa po ni kupion po li wuske. Singe talala sa pa sa mama. Olia, this is a story about my good, good tante, Ma Coquelin. You know, one Monday afternoon, the woman taking sick, they had to call the priest for she. The priest come and read she all, she writes. You know, in the end now, the priest ball, secula, seculorum. She say, well, priest, if it's rum you're talking, Bring mine without water, na. Young, day, two, cat. Lendi a pwe mi di marco clean to me malai. Voye kuye la we pu bali extreme monsieur. Le la be we ve iti se kula se kulo rom marco clean ti se se o Monsieur la be. Monsieur la be. For the refreshments, however, we shan't be having any rum. <laughs> But it was good to hear it in song. Shall break every chain. The lion of Judah shall break every chain. The lion of Judah shall break every chain. 
every chain and give us the victory again and again. Hosanna, 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 Amen. Okay. This reading focuses on the struggle of the Shouter Baptists against prohibition. It is taken from a chapter called, And Give Us the Victory Again and Again. They had already heard the good news by word of mouth, but still they cheered and clapped when it was announced on the radio in the evening. The Legislative Council, after deliberating and debating for a year and a half, had voted to repeal the Shouter Baptist Prohibition Ordinance. Sonny was almost eight years old. Gwyneth let him stay up for the conversation in the gallery that evening. The Shouters had won. For over three decades, the authorities had waged a relentless war on them trying to stamp out their faith. But the shouters had kept right on worshiping in their way. It did not matter how many of them the police arrested, beat up, hauled before the courts, fined, or jailed. It did not matter how many shouter churches were demolished. They had stood their ground. Queen's spiritual children were always harking back to events in the particular history of their church. And Sonny had heard again and again the story of the Lion of Judah mystical tabernacle moving up the hill so that the police wouldn't mash down their place of worship. This piece of history lived in his imagination as another intriguing Bible story like Noah's Ark floating safely with all those animals packed into it, or baby Jesus sleeping in a cow shed on his bed of dry grass, which Sonny had learned was the meaning of the word hay. He had heard many of the stories of the church from his uncles. Malcolm and Cyrus were born in the time of the ordinance, so they did not know any other church than the one up the hill surrounded by thick bush. They had never been to prayers in the building behind Mother Queen Lottie's house. But like all members of Queen's Church, Sonny's uncles knew the history of the church before it was outlawed. They felt as though they had lived through every piece of that history. And increasingly, as he grew older, so did Sonny. Queen and her church had pretty much ignored the ordinance until the police struck at leader Benjamin's church over in Clancy one Sunday morning, and then at Mother Ruth's church in Beauregard the following Sunday. Those two attacks were the warning to Queen that it was time to go up into Lokono Mountain. Like other Shouter Baptist churches, they would have to hold a service after dark. Baptism would have to be even earlier than four-day morning. The coldness of the water would then be just another tribulation to make them strong in their faith, Queen said. They would still baptize people in Beauregard River, but they would have to choose a different spot. They would have to follow the river deeper into the bush and find a place well off the beaten track to hold baptisms. As for moving the church up the hill, they would build an enduring tabernacle up there, not keep on holding their service week after week in any flimsy now-for-now now shelter. We build in to stay up there for a generation if need be, Queen said. And so it was. Shouters would remain in the wilderness for 33 years and four months. The whole church went up the hill 
on the Sunday after the attack on Mother Ruth's church. They chose one of those flattish parts of the mountainside where the ground seemed to recline for a moment, as though Lokono was taking a short rest before continuing upwards to the sky. They labored for the whole day. Some cooked, some went up and down the hill to fetch drinking water and whatever else had to be fetched, and some worked on preparing the spot. They had brought with them cutlasses, hoes, pitchforks, shovels, and a luchette borrowed from Mr. Mohammed. The church was very grateful to Mr. Mohammed, for without the luchette, the work would have been much harder and would have taken much longer. The spot was not entirely flat. It was a gentle slope, and the task was to dig down at its upper end and level off the ground some more. By nightfall, they had cleared the bush and trees, dug down a bit, and begun the leveling. Queen consecrated the spot and held service there on Sunday evening in a circle of trees and high bush. The following Saturday, they finished preparing the ground and put up a jupa where they would hold service for the next few Sundays until they could fence the compound. As time passed, this jupa became a church with tapir walls and carrot roof. Then they built a modest palais and chapel. They decided they would not put on a mourner room. Apart from the smallness of the place, they would not want to leave anybody up there for several days and nights. Not in those times that were so dangerous for shouters. It would be safe enough to continue putting down mourners in the room on Queen's home compound. There was nothing about going on mourning ground that could attract the attention of the police, for that was the quietest thing that shouters did, as quiet as the graveyard. As soon as Malcolm and Cyrus were old enough, they joined the ranks of the lookouts. They took turns with others at standing on the inside of the gate or patrolling the fence, they kept their eyes peeled in the pitch dark night for lights winking through the bush and listened for the sound of footsteps coming up the hill. There were false alarms with the lookouts rushing in to warn the church because they thought the police were on their way and the church springing into action to evacuate needlessly, but better safe than sorry. The church had a clear plan for escape. Members of the congregation would quickly snuff out every candle and the one flambeau that the church allowed itself. Then they would wait in complete silence and stillness, ready to file out through the hidden opening at the back if any police should seek to break into the compound. They would take the flambeau with them, for it would still be giving off pitch oil fumes from the newly extinguished flame. Those fumes would signal to the police that the congregation had just left, would not have got very far from the place, and could still be caught. Officers could also hit upon the idea of using the pitch oil in the church's own flambeau to sprinkle the place and set it on fire. On one occasion, a crashing sound in the bush, accompanied by a cuss word, did turn out to be the police. The congregation were already poised to flee when the officers found the main gate. One member of the raiding posse was spewing cuss words and quarreling about these devil worshippers who had made him bruise his knee and sprain his wrist in trying to break the fall. When they pushed the gate down, shouting, police, everybody here under arrest, Everybody was either crouching or sitting in the grove of black sage further down the mountain, listening to them. For Sonny, this was the best part of the story. He always laughed uproariously at the thought of police up by the empty church shouting at nobody. The church members waited in the black sage, listening, but there were no sounds of destruction coming from the compound. Indeed, there were no sounds at all. The officers seemed not to have lingered. On the other hand, they could be up there still, lying in wait. So the church members slowly rose to their feet, tiptoed down the other track to the village, 
a route more treacherous than the one the police had used, and scattered to their homes. Sometime later, a policeman from Clancy Station whispered to Queen's brother that the party of officers, having shone their torches around the yard and into the open buildings, had decided that it was an abandoned place, not worth the sweat to break it down. Their mission was to arrest miscreants, and since they could not find any to arrest, they turned the tail and got the hell out of there. In making their way back down the mountainside, they carefully avoided the boulder on which Corporal Regis had come to grief. I will end with a very short reading that also belongs under the topic of culture. People need, people do need to, to defend and conserve their culture and to be proud of it. But in a healthy culture, people also recognize negative trends that need to be rooted out. This is taken from a chapter called, How Are We Going to Keep Them Down? Right. Um, in her childhood, Gwyneth had attended four different primary schools in places all over the colony. Moraine, Corial, Lakpat, Trois Rivières, wherever Popa was posted. Like every one of those schools, Oropuna Government School, where Gwyneth did her first teaching, resounded daily with weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, brought on by the crack of whips and belts and rulers on children's skin. This was just normal, everyday school noise, which did not turn any heads, the only beatings that interested anybody enough to make them look in that direction were the ones in which a schoolmaster doubled a boy over a desk, pulled the boy's pants down, and with a thick leather belt or tamron whip, near flayed the skin of his bottom, which was exposed for all to see. Benchings, witnessed by the whole school, were not an everyday occurrence and were spoken of in hushed tones. She would carry in her head for the rest of her life the sound that came from her standard five classmate at Lakpat Government School, Freddie Kwamina, piercing the hush that surrounded his benching. Freddie was a skinny boy with a head that seemed too large for his body. All his teachers thus far had agreed that he just could not learn, but Mr. Taylor seemed to think that it was just stubbornness and laziness. Gwyneth caught sight of the terror in Freddie's eyes as Mr. Taylor, having chased the other boys off the two benches, Freddie's and the one in front of his, lifted him off the floor and slammed his body over the desk. There he remained like a broken stick, bent at the point where his legs were joined to the rest of him, and uncomfortably keeping his head up. <clears throat> Mr. Taylor's belt came down on him again and again with an awful crashing sound. Usually boys would try to salvage some shred of their dignity by not crying, not giving a whimper during this experience. It was a feat at which some of them succeeded. Freddie gripped the backrest of the bench in front of him as his whole body jerked with each blow, but he kept his silence. The whole school held its breath. Suddenly, Freddie let out an eerie, high-pitched squeal, a piglet sound that startled everybody, including Mr. Taylor. It did not resemble any human sound that Gwyneth had ever heard. The teacher's arm remained suspended in midair for a moment before it brought down a last blow on the boy. After that, he released him. Gwyneth remembered the incident vividly, but never could recall what error in his exercise book had earned Freddy that particular assault. <laughs> Oh, 
<laughs> okay, so yeah, let's get started with our open forum. All right, see you, chat. Hi, Mul. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, Jazz. I'm good How to you see going? you. Thank you. Thank them, you. Papa. Um, <laughs> I haven't read it as yet, of course. I have to yeah, get the book. I know. <laughs> right. Um, and in terms of the humor, I remember the one thing I remember about Crick Crack yes. is the little children or the narrator trying to imitate the way in which they were saying the Lord's Prayer, <coughs> which are in heaven. Yes. Right? Um, yeah. Right. Yes. Um, so, two things actually. Um, the violence you, the last elementary yeah, right? Right. <laughs> right? Um, so just about last week, I think, you know, the Brother B program in Tobago, that's quite popular, right? There was this long deliberation on the need to beat again. I, I know people will be saying that be, right? because, because of how, you know, they, they the violence in the yeah. right? Um, yeah. The need to beat again. And yeah. it is a, mm -hmm. one of those um, reactions to mm -hmm. the spate of violence in the violence, schools, yeah, but right? they, they should examine that. Um, mm -hmm. So the, I don't know if it's a question, mm -hmm. but I mean, I think the business about um, how we treat with children um, and how we use violence to engage um, this disagreement yeah. is a story that still has to happen in a very deep way in our school curriculums yes. um, yes. and at the political level. But those are precisely where it's not happening, right? Yes. Um, so I don't know what, having exposed what you did in Congote, one day, one day Congote, what that might mean in terms of pushing us into that direction some yes. more. And the second is connected to that. I had an aunt, I think I mentioned her to you already, Auntie Ovita. She was beaten yes. so badly in primary school that she lost her hearing. Jeez, you and therefore she developed, well, mm. she retained a layer of the Creole because of course she wouldn't have progressed in a oh, certain way. Okay, yes. And that was precisely another reason for which she was discriminated against as a market vendor. So mm -hmm. the violence we got at Fulade, if she's mm -hmm. here, we spoke about that at some point. So the violence we got more, brought on more problems and yes. that problem was itself um, the basis for more discrimination. So I don't no, know if you could just... Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thanks, yes. Um, I don't know, you see, we, we, are, we are just too... We, we take for granted that... that now, a man, if a man hit a woman, they're coming for his tail, eh? And they, they're dragging him off. I, I remember a time, um, somebody on campus, we, we, I think some of us were, t were talking about the campaign we, we were doing, and s somebody said, where, where's a little slap? I say, but well, if a man give you a little slap, you, the, the police will come for you. Why could we give a little slap to the children as though they're not human beings too? It's a long way we have to go, you know. And I would like you all to know that we managed to get that law passed through Kamala. Kamala was the Minister of Education at the time, and she's also of that view that we should stop beating children, right? Um, and as a result, a lot of people blaming her for it, saying is she that removed the beating. But we should do a little more examination of our culture. But I don't know if people even understand what our culture is. You see the same man, John Stone, there in the, in the thing I read before? He, th there was a time they, were they decided to have a discussion about culture. And John Stone said, culture, what culture? Right? So we still have a lot of people who would say that now. Culture, what culture? You know? So I don't know. It's a whole program that, when I say program, that people need to talk about it more. I, I, I really don't know. I mean, of course, you have to have a, a, um, what a, a structured program, I guess. We, we went all over the country and did workshops with, with people, every part, of, well, not every, but I mean a lot of the country, east, west, north, and south. We talked to people. A lot of them were, were convinced, but it's very easy for them to, to, to go back to it, you know? So, so <coughs> I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm flummoxed at, at that particular thing about our culture. And as I said before, there are parts of the culture we have to root out, and that is one of them, you know? Um, okay, who is... <laughs> well, well, yes, um. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on that same topic, you know, it reminded me of a, the opening <coughs> of one of Naipaul's stories, where he mm -hmm. said, you know, teachers in Trinidad are not very well paid, yeah. but they're allowed to flog as much as they want. Yeah. But you yes. see the benching, it's, it still continues in YTC. 
Oh God, really? They're yes. letting them, but no, no, it no, no. It still no, continues no. in YTC. But that don't help them, that don't make and, them behave. And um, interestingly, another person who mentions it, yes. not the beating by teachers, but the domestic beating, mm -hmm. is Shadow yeah. Winston Bailey. In his first album, he has a song called Young Winston. Yes. Where he oh. speaks about that. And part of the chorus, he was, He's singing about himself, and he's saying that as a child, sometimes he used to wish he was dead. Oh, gosh. Really? Check hmm. it out. It's on YouTube. Young yes. Winston by Shadow. Yes. My, my, my goodness. No. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. So thanks, Kim. I'll, I will look up that. Yeah. Uh, hi, Merle. I am extremely happy to see you. I haven't seen you in decades. Yes. yes. Good to see you, too. Um, I want to go off a little bit because mm -hmm. uh, from the two speakers, Marjorie Thorpe and uh, Dr. Sheila. Thorpe and Dr. Mm -hmm. Rampasad, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. I started, the way they approached mm -hmm. not just one day, one day Congo Tay, but yeah. your whole body but of work. Yeah. I wondered if I could ask you a little bit about your process. Uh-huh. No, well, it has to be the most indisciplined writing process in the world. Right. I cannot identify any, any particular step, you know, that, that I take in there. I don't know. I, I get an idea. And in fact, the, the idea for, for One Day, One Day Congo to yeah? is, is Eddie here? That's Eddie in the back there? No? All right. Um, that 1995, I think I was going on... Oh, I can I leave again in the university? They, where, mm -hmm. where academics get a leave? A leave? Sabbatical. Yes, yeah, sabbatical. And Eddie came to the up, up by me, um, or by us, to, to you know, campaigning. And we, we talked and so, and Eddie, Eddie's roots are there too, where, where I live. He was brought up by um, my, my and my sister's great aunts by marriage. My, my grandfather was married to one of these ladies, the Shallows, Shallow, um, Laura, Laura May and Eleanor Shallow. And it's, I mean, his story, I decided to incorporate. I mean, not every detail of it is, is that, but I mean, the, the home setting with these two women who decided. You see, a, a girl came and, a, a girl was sent from the orphanage. You know the orphanage places? girls when they leave in, in homes as domestics. And um, the, the girl got, got pregnant while she was there. And <laughs> Eddie told me a story ab about her leaving. She, she, she got another place to be, you know, another, I don't know what the job was, but um, so it's, Eddie told me that when she started to pack up her clothes to go, and she started to pack up his own, those, those old ladies said, um, where you, 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 you think you're going with um, with, with Eddie? <laughs> they, 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 they kept him. He, she, she wasn't allowed to take him. You know, I mean, they were in contact all the time, but um, they, he, he was their child now. Right? So um, he, he told me that story. The, one of the, th well, the, the, the thing is finding a topic. Yeah? That, that um, there was a topic that I also wanted to deal with, which is to do with the different types of family forms that we have that are totally disrespected. If you're married to a man and bringing up children, and he's the head of the, yesterday I had a young fella come from the statistical office to, um, to, to take information about who living in what house. We live on a compound with, with, with a number of houses, family land. And he, um, oh Lord, where, where, where are reach with this story now, you see? Yes, you, you forget you got it. ideas. Yeah, what? Yes, yeah, so, yeah, so, so it gave me some ideas, but Lord, there's something specific I was going to, to say there. Oh. The, the types of families, yes, right? And that children can be brought up safely and intelligently and efficiently in any family that loves them and takes care of them. I mean, you, 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 you have some nuclear families that get children help, right? So it's not only our types of families that, that um, when I say our types of families, they're non-nuclear families. It, it, they, look, at, look, look at Eddie. Eddie, Eddie became a, a member of parliament. Eddie ran a football club. He ran a steel band, right? Brought up by these two ladies, right? 
Um, Lord, there's, there's some, some, some other thing I wanted to say there, yes, but um, anyway, um, I might remember it and, so, and come So up you weave these ideas together into, into a cohesive thing. whole. Y yes, it, it, but there, there's another thing about the, the, the family forms. Um, oh, Lord. <laughs> anyway, if, if I remember it later on, I will say it, if he's still here. Yeah. <coughs> hmm. A few months ago, Well, a copy of this excellent book was given to me as a gift okay, yes. some time ago, and I wanted to share it mm -hmm. with my daughters and with their children. Yes. Now, one of my granddaughters started what we call a family book club. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Yeah. And so I, I wanted them to have the benefit, especially the younger ones, mm -hmm. of how things were in that era. Yes. And, and so um, <coughs> I introduced this book to them. Well, we spent, because we meet once a week, yeah. Mm -hmm. We tell tell them this the children are, are located all over the world. <laughs> That's yes. right, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Only one daughter and one granddaughter in yes. Trinidad. The yes. others are all scattered. Mainly in different parts of the of states. The states yes. Very different parts <laughs> of the states. Mm -hmm. Anyway. <coughs> After we had done this book and we were dis discussing it week by week, mm -hmm. at the final meeting on it, one of my daughters said that she was very glad I had done it. So she really had been glad to, to, to have that opportunity. And the, the thing that she found in, was most striking, she felt, mm -hmm. was that children were not treated as harshly nowadays as they were at that time. Mm -hmm. And I think that is true, yeah. but certainly not, th that is, they're not treated as badly in schools as they were in those days. Yes. But there is still a great deal of um, mistreatment yeah. in the homes. Violence, yeah. So I am not sure what, what can be done or what should be done, yeah. but something certainly needs to be done. Yeah. It can go so, yeah. About mm -hmm. the treatment of children. Yeah. Yeah, the, um, the corporal punishment, you know, which yes. those of my generation took for granted. Took for granted, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's certainly not acceptable anymore, but it is in fact happening. And so it really isn't surprising that there, that the, <laughs> violence occurs in the schools yes, exactly. because those ch children do come from homes where there is a great deal of violence mm -hmm. and that's what we have to see we hope and pray yes. that something can be done to improve that situation mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. We, well, we need to, to really start a, a serious na national conversation about it, but, but I want you to tell the audience, if, if, if your mother doesn't mind, how old she is. I told this lady that I want to live, my ambition is to live as long as she has lived and to be so compassmentous, because you see how scattered I am? You see that talk you just give there, she ain't forgetting nothing, right? You, you, I, I can reveal, I... Well, I, I didn't get the cold. 
<laughs> and, and you did. <laughs> and and that, that is what has caused your uh, <laughs> disturbance. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. I'm usually... But I, yes, I've been very, very lucky. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. And I wish you a long, long really? life. Thank you. You're going to tell the, the guests how old she is? Oh, my mom is 98 now. 98. Wow. Take that. Take that. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> mm -hmm. I think there was somebody over there, no? Okay, so folks, funny how time flies when you're having fun, <coughs> but in the interest of time, we're just going to have two more interventions, and then we move <coughs> on to the last item, which is the vote of thanks. So two more interventions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, good evening everybody. Rowena. Hi, Hi, Rowena. Hi, Rowena. Hi, good to see you, Rowena. Yes. So, mm -hmm. first of all, well, I just wanted to congratulate you on your work. I know Thank this you. is something that you had to keep at to yeah. get it finished. So, even though we read Merle's work and it seems so <laughs> wonderful, if you know Merle, you'll know that it's, it's something yeah. that she persists with. It doesn't yes, just um, mm -hmm. come overnight. And um, I also, well, I mean, I started reading it, okay? Mm -hmm. So I've, I've read a few chapters already, okay. and I can recognize you in it so strongly, <laughs> and your life's work and all of it. Yes. But I, I wanted also to say that one of the important things in the book for me is what Sheila talked about in terms of the protagonists and characters being agents in their own right. Yes. Because in so many books, you know, everything happens to the protagonists and you respond. But um, Gwyneth and the others make things happen. You know, yes. and I think that's the real mark of the activists, that yes. you have a, a, a sense of the world that you want, mm -hmm. and you yes. act on the world to make it happen, you know? Yes. So yes. as in the corporal punishment and that campaign we did, you know, yes. it, we, we had to make that happen. It, it just didn't happen like that. that yes. Well, immediately, yeah. but I mean, you know, so somebody could start a new conversation, yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And it needs to continue because it's yeah. so strongly embedded yeah, but in the country. Because I suppose the, the campaign is really incomplete, you know? They Precisely. They need to do more on that. Yeah. But I want, I, sorry, you're, you're okay. going to you so thanks, Will. Yeah, thanks to you. Roina is a member of Working Women, and it was, she's a teacher educator really opposed the corporal punishment and um, it is she who suggested we do a campaign um, against co corporation. The idea came out of her head, all right? Okay. Hi, David. I actually have a question. Someone? Okay. <laughs> Well, th thanks, but no thanks. I was just waving back to Mul. I, I, I mean, yeah? What is it, David? I, I thought you said hi, David, so I waved. Yes, I, I did. I wave at you. I see your face. <laughs> but, but, but good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon to you. Hi, good afternoon. Yes. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Even though I'm holding the mic. Um, in a very real sense, the world, the Trinidad and Tobago that existed mm -hmm. in, in the book, that's depicted in the book, doesn't mm -hmm. exist anymore. Yeah, no, that is true. Mm -hmm. And what advice would you give to young social activists who mm -hmm. want to write and capture something as you have done in this mm -hmm. time of their yeah. era? Yes, yeah, so, so, so that, you mean, you mean for, for them to write stuff that, um, that is, is about us? Yes. Yeah. Well, I don't know. You see that intrusion of American TV? I don't know what is to say there. My poor little grandson, every time he calls a little creature like a worm or a butterfly, call that a bug, he gets so much book for a fella. The bug, Americans call everything small and moving a bug. You know, and there are other things in his speech like that. That, that, that you know, is, is just not us. We have to keep teaching him the proper Clear term for a lot of things, right? But um, yeah, yes, Aisha, I, I think a lot of it comes out. You see, the, the radio should carry, radio and TV should, should carry a lot more um, conversation about topics that, that, that we need to, to um, 
to, to deal with. But you're asking how, 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 how we can, they, that, trend, that um, version of Trinidad is not there anymore. Well, they, they, they need to find out. I mean, I wasn't alive for the whole, uh, the time span that I wrote about, but I, you, you know, I know it from, well, we didn't get this history in school. Eh? We only got history about England. So, so, so I read up some, some history about that, that time, the time before I was born, you know, and, um, and, and I read up old novels too. I, I, read, I read up other, other what, you, what Sheila call it, period, period novel, period literature, right? Okay, yes, so it, it, people have to move and, it, and perhaps there are not enough people willing to move. Do, put it in your hand, put it in your hand, put a hand, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, again, thank you so much, Meryl. Um, well, thank you. I, I think that we wanted to do this because this really describes a, an era that I don't think we, we, we talk about it, we hear Enough, about it, but yeah. we really don't understand it. Mm -hmm. There were so many things in this book. For instance, the whole business of the steel band. Mm -hmm. You know, I think my mom also, in, in the last mm -hmm. time when she talked to, to Merle, we mm -hmm. talked about the fact that it was amazing that the, this came out of all these little young people, young mm -hmm. boys. And one of the things was how close a lot of them were Mm -hmm. together, they were near each other, but very mm -hmm. important how willing they were to share. Mm -hmm. So one did something, he told the, he told yes. the others, they then did something, they yes. and there was that sharing, which yes. I think is something that we, we want to, um, to look at and again to see how we're doing. Mm -hmm. And the steel band, I think that description, <laughs> fictional supposedly, I love the, the comment uh, made, but that description, that now needs to be continued. So just now when you said about young, the social activists, I would like to know how it's developing, what's going on now. Mm -hmm. Because the steel band has changed, and yes, what, what's actually happening now? So that's the kind of thing that I think the young mm -hmm. social <laughs> activists can do. Um, I'm hoping that we, National Trust, will be able to feature this um, mm -hmm. on one of our um, our talks, yeah. um, so that if you hear this again, we will be promoting it. Um, yes. I don't yeah. know, Namni is all in charge of this. I don't know anything <laughs> yeah. about the technology, yeah, but I true. think that he is going to try and come up with a way of taking this and sharing it with yes. a much wider population. And we have yes. the diaspora as well, because yeah. Merle, this is a fabulous book and it really yeah. needs to be seen. I see our friend from, I still call you paper base, I'm sorry, but <laughs> I know yeah. Paperbase has the yes. book, um, and there, I'm sure there are others, but I know Paperbase has it. I saw it myself. So those who haven't bought it yet, I really think you need to buy it. It's, at, it's now at, um, it's now at, at lit, Bocas Lit on Alcazar Street. Mm -hmm. I, I have nothing to do with Paperbase. Huh? Yeah. Oh, well then, I went talking about it so much that the last set must have been bought. But um, yes, please keep checking because yeah. it really is a fabulous <coughs> book. When we did it in our book club, we did it in six weeks. Mm -hmm. And the last week of the book club, Merle actually very, very, very graciously mm -hmm. came on and, and, mm -hmm. and had all these people from all over the world talking to her. Mm -hmm. And um, those of you who have families, maybe you can read it together. Uh, and because it, it, you know, it takes a while to read. And, um, and if you read it together, that might also help. So just thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Right yes, yes, the signing could be done right here. Mm -hmm. Wonderful folks. In everything that we do, we must give acknowledgement and we must give thanks. And Ms. Milhoche has a number of people who are instrumental to this event happening and to inspire the creation of this story for us, One Day, One Day Congo Tea. Firstly, we would like to thank Dr. Margaret MacDonald, Dowald, uh, Director of the National Trust for kindly allowing us to use this beautiful space. To the members of the group, 
Seon Bagai Patwa for their enormous help in putting together this today. Yes, let's give them a round of applause. To Mill's son and daughter-in-law, Namdi and Rona, and their friends, Ayinde Burgess and, London, and Lyndon St. Bernard. Give thanks. To Drs. Marjorie Thorpe and Sheila Rampersad, and also Ms. Halcyon Prescott Alexander for speaking during this afternoon's launch. To resource persons who helped with the inspiration of this book, and I have a number here to mention Professor Fonzo Ayengina. Mr. Eddie Hart, teacher Kathy Adams, mother Marjorie Anderson, Kim Johnson, N2 Springer, Professor Bridget Meriton, Nam D. Hodge again, and of course, uh, Jeremy, ooh, I do not want to butcher this name. Point, point, uh, French, pointe. Pointing, okay. To the caterers for the refreshments you're about to have, Deborah Julian and Shellon Stewart, give thanks. And last but not least, most importantly, all of you gathered here today for taking your time to come to the launch. We would like to thank you enormously.